we don't get to talk a lot, so I want to begin with an icebreaker, if that's okay. Um, I don't know how much we have in common, but there is this. You carried Curtis Brown as a teammate on your back, <laughs> and now I have to carry Curtis Brown as a teammate on my back. Right? So we that's could start right. there. We that's could bond right. over that's that. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, work <laughs> carrying Brownie around all these years. In all seriousness, when you get hired for this job as general manager, does somebody hand you a list of all the other GM's phone numbers so that you can get to know them, so that you can grease the wheels, so that if you need to make a deal? Uh, how, do you, how do you enter this kind of, of club of GM's? Um, you know, everyone's been great. All the other GM's have been great. So kind of fortunately and unfortunately, it was a busy time with the draft happening. But that being said, um, all the GM's are obviously there for the draft, and we had a, a GM meeting before the draft. So... Um, that was kind of my opportunity to meet everyone and you know everyone came up and introduced the guys I didn't know introduced themselves and said hello and everyone was everyone was really nice and it was a good kind of good opening for me. Having played here and now essentially taking over for Doug Wilson who was the GM when, when you were here, does all that prior experience make this job for you here and now more personal? Yeah I think it means a little bit more. We um, Myself and my family, we really enjoyed living here and playing here. And, you know, the Sharks fans are, are so passionate and, you know, they have the love of love of the game. So, you know, from my standpoint, you know, as a player, I didn't want to let them down. And now that, you know, I'm in the position I am now, I don't, same thing, I don't want to let them down. As a player, could you ever have imagined being the general manager of any franchise? Was that was that ever in your, your plans? Um, I think I always knew I wanted to end up in management at some point when I was done playing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still, uh, you know, something to kind of hard, hard to envision yourself doing while you're playing. But, you know, I was hoping to maybe someday get here. And now that I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate to have this job. I'm sure you'll go through a bunch of tough decisions and thoughts and you, things you'll have to go through. People might see what I'm about to ask as an Eklund or a Bordalo question. It's not, I promise you. But as you evaluate any AHL player, in your organization. How do you know when is the right time to bring them up and give them an opportunity? Well, uh, I think for me and, and for our staff is that, one, they're, they're doing what we've asked them to do, the things that we've asked them to improve on and to work on. And then secondly, are they kind of doing those things, but are they also dominating? I think when you watch enough AHL games, um, you can kind of start to see the players and, and say that they don't they don't belong in this league anymore. <laughs> so I think that's those are kind of the two things that we're looking for is them improving on the things that we've asked them to improve on and then watching and say this guy's in the wrong league and ready for the next step. Is it okay for players that get brought up if they're not ready to go back and then return when, when maybe they are ready? Is, you try and make it so that you don't have to do that or is that, an, is that an okay part of the process? Yeah, it's definitely okay. I think in an ideal world, you want to make sure the players when they come up they're ready and they're almost overripe and that you don't have to send right. them back down but right. development everyone's development path is different um so you know some guys might come up and hit the ground running and others might come up and stumble a little bit and lose their confidence and they need to go down and kind of reshape their game and, and build their confidence back up but then come back up later in the year so everything's not the same every player is not the same but so it, it's definitely okay if they come up and you know, they, they're not quite ready and they need to go back down. With the Sharks team that you take over, obviously there are some returning players under contract. There's also new players that are free agents you signed. Uh, there's also the pipeline. As we kind of just look at that third group, the, the pipeline in the future, what priority and how, how much importance do they have over shaping your next three to five years here? Oh, they're, they're usually important. I think the way you watch the league now, especially in the flat, flat cap, you need to draft well, then you need to develop well, and those young players that are in the pipeline, they're, they're essential to, to winning. Basically, you're going to have your teams that are your part of your team that is kind of well paid and making a big chunk of the cap. So to be successful, you're going to need your young players to, young kind of cheap players to, to be successful and be good players and be a part of the core. So, you know, we're, we got high hopes for a lot of those guys. You take over this team, and it is kind of a project where they've been not making the playoffs three straight years, first time in franchise history. Ideally, right, you get all this solved in one season, right? But that, that's, that's <laughs> ideally. But realistically, um, how much time do you, do you give yourself? I know there's, 
an urgency to all this too. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, a, somewhat of a difficult question. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, there's an urgency to get back to be successful and kind of try and start another run here. They had so much success for so long. It was kind of a unique situation. So right. we want to get back there, but we also know that you can't step, skip steps to get there. So, um, you know, whether that takes, you know, a year or two, three, four years, um, you know, I think we'll get there and we're going to take the necessary steps and try and build this the right way. Is there a certain aspect of, I've heard people say this, paying the price for all the success the Sharks had throughout the 2010s? Um, that maybe the situation you find yourself in is, is a little bit paying for, for how good and how competitive this franchise was for so long? I, I think so, for sure. I think sports are kind of cyclical that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you have your, where you're kind of on top of the world, and the Sharks even extended it more than most teams. Most teams have, you know, five, six, seven years of success. The Sharks had right. almost 20. Right. And, uh, so when that happens, you kind of, it's kind of inevitable that you end up on the other side of it, where you have a, have some lean years and you know, when you're in the win-now mode, you end up kind of trading some prospects and draft picks and, and players get older as you're kind of going. So um, it's definitely a little bit of a price to pay, but, um, you know, I think everyone would say it's probably worth it, what they've, the success that they had. I know they didn't yeah. get the cup at the end of the day, but they were close many years and it was a, a long, successful run. The casual Sharks fan might show up to a game this season and say, well, I recognize a lot of these players, so how different can this team actually be? Uh, but I do feel like under the hood, if the Sharks were a car, everything from the hockey side of it to the, the coaching staff, I, I think there's been a lot of changes that may not be seen necessarily in personnel on the ice. Can you describe how different you think this franchise is basically since the end of last season? Well, I mean, there's just a lot of new faces, and yeah. what comes with that is kind of a different feeling. But, um, you know, from our standpoint, it's kind of, trying to change the culture a little bit and get people, uh, get the group as a whole to be a little bit more competitive, um, a competitive group, harder to play against group. So hopefully when you do watch a game, even though there, there are a lot of players who've been here in the last couple of years, you'll see a group that's a little bit, has a little bit more of an edge, a little bit more competitive, and, it, and it's kind of plays the kind of style of hockey that you need to play to win in this league. It's also a group that seems to be a, a little bit more established in, in years in the NHL, a little bit more of a veteran group that you've tried to at least start this season with. Is there a goal in mind that you want to make this roster tough to crack? Yeah, I think, you know, just looking at the roster and looking at the games last year, I think the last thing you want to do is put your, your rookies and your young players and prospects in a position where they have to play in right. the, at the NHL level and they have to develop at the NHL level. I think for us it's important that those guys come up when they're ready and they earn their spots on the team. We don't want to be in the position where we say, well, we don't really have anyone here, so let's bring someone up and just stick them in the lineup. We want those guys to earn their way up and, and force, force their way up in the lineup. And I think you know, we were able to do that as with some of the guys that we brought in over the summer. Scoring was an issue for this team last season. I think it was more than a quarter of the games, one goal or fewer, scored for the Sharks. If that continues to present itself, you know, 20 to 40 games into this season, is that something you can remedy as a GM? Is it on the players, yeah. on the coach? How, how do you kickstart that, if that is something that can be achieved? I mean, hopefully we, we're a little bit better offensively yeah. with some of the things um, Quinn yeah. and his staff are trying to implement in the style of play. Um, but I think it's a little bit everything. I mean, it's it's the players. It's it's on me on on uh, the roster, the players, the coaches. It's kind of on us all to try and keep evolving this thing and become a little bit better offensively and and be able to create offense at a higher rate. Is it nightly conversations that you have with David Quinn? Is it uh, text messages yeah. or how, how in intertwined are you guys? Yeah, I mean, we talk you know several several times a day in person on the phone yeah. or text. Um, so I think it's, I think our relationship is, is critical to the organization. And, you know, I don't, don't know if you've talked to Quinny, but that's one of his, his best and strongest suits yeah. is his communication and, and how personable he is. So he's been easy to work with from my standpoint. And, um, you know, we're definitely keep the open lines of communication. This is a difficult time, right? You, you want to get things right. You, you feel probably the pressure and the time pressure to do that, but at the same respect, it's a great opportunity, isn't it? I mean, th this franchise has some of the pieces already, and you've got to feel pretty excited about it. 
Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited, and it is uh, one of the things that was in, intriguing about the job is, you know, Doug did such a, a great job here for so long, but now it's it's kind of the opportunity here to kind of put my own stamp on things and build things up, you know, the way I envision it and, uh, you know, Jonathan envisions, envisions the team being. So to have that opportunity, you don't get it too often in sports, so it's something that I, I'm relishing and enjoying and, uh, you know, look forward to doing. The GM things in your family blood, I know that. And you've been in the front office of hockey franchises before, but when you're the guy, when you're the GM, you make that first trade, you make that first phone call, do, do all the GM things. Um, does it kind of strike you as like a little bit surreal? Yeah. You feel, you feel yeah. established in the moment yet? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely, uh, you know, going back to the draft and, yeah. and our staff did a great job then, but, you know, helping them make some selections and then, you know, working with, Don Waddell, who's, you know, one of the most tenured GMs in the league to, w to work on that Brett Burns trade. It was definitely a little surreal. And, at, you know, at the end of the day, I think I was, you know, telling my wife, it's like, eh, it's actually, you know, it's, it's kind of pretty cool. So, yeah. so it's, uh, it's been nice. Last thing here, what will it, or I should say, when will we know that you put your stamp on this team? Obviously, you've, you've taken something over. It existed before you got here. You're trying to work on, on fixing some things, realigning some things. Will there be a moment when you, when you feel like, okay, this is now something I've created? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I hope, I don't know if it's this year or next year or the year after. I, I, I would hope there's, you know, maybe there's a game or situation happens and you, you kind of look down and say, this is, this is what I want. This is what I envision. Right. And uh, like, you, like I said, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I, I, I imagine there'll be a moment where you know it'll kind of hit me that this is, this is uh, looking the way I, I was hoping it was going to look. Awesome. Appreciate the time. Obviously, best of luck. All right. Thanks. I appreciate <laughs> it.